All right, so we're in lesson number six of renewing, and we're going to talk a little bit about fellowship today and understanding open hospitality. Um, so just to cover a few basics, I think that'll help us in this conversation. Uh, we're asking things in this concept of renewal, like where am I, who am I, and where is God? And as we shift um, outside of ourselves into interaction and into uh, kind of putting the scriptures into performance, kind of bringing them to life in fellowship, uh, it's another place where we can ask, where am I, who am I, and where is God? And it should be a path of discovery as we interact with people, uh, both inside the church and those who uh, are in the midst of the church and around the church and those who we invite into the church. And so um, asking these questions, and then again, coming back to this, that scripture is informative, prayer centers us, worship engages us, but God is found in all creation. And I really like this picture uh, that I've included with this page, and I'll finally reference it, of uh, just this like endless uh, table of communion and fellowship and a meal. And so much of the scriptures centers our relationship with God and interaction with God and people around meals and around that kind of common uh, interaction. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about today is, is fellowship. And the subheading that I gave was understanding open hospitality. And I, and I want to clarify that um, we have to dismiss this Western American idea of hospitality, the the dinner party hospitality, and begin to allow ourselves to embrace more of a uh, scriptural definition of hospitality and a Eastern adoption of hospitality where it's literally an openness to the other. And if you look at Jesus's life, there is an openness to whomever he encounters. There's an openness uh, in John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. There was this giving, this openness, this posture towards the world uh, that's engaging. And that's what we're talking about, a, a hospitality. It's breaking down the lines of us and them or me and the other and embracing uh, the interaction of we, no matter where we might go. Uh, you know, Psalm 51 speaks, doesn't speak to this as much, um, but I think there's something in the relational aspects that we looked at last week in verse 14 through 17. Uh, my tongue will sing of your righteousness, Lord. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want sacrifice or you, I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. A sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. And so it's this relational interaction, it's this voice of conversation that comes uh, through hospitality. And we experience that like the psalmist does here, uh, not through our rituals and not through our um, actions, but through our relationship and through our connectivity and hospitality and our communion with God. And so we're going to look at that in the same context uh, of how God models that and therefore how we can implement that in the fellowship and in our relationships with people around us. Uh, there's a great quote. Uh, it's a book called, um, I think this one's called From Desiring God by J.K.A. Smith. Uh, he's a Canadian uh, theologian, but Human persons are understood not as fundamentally thinking machines, but rather as believing animals or essentially religious creatures defined by a worldview that is pre-rational or super-rational. Okay, big words. I probably could have cut that quote off, but basically we have to understand we're not just brains on sticks. Okay, we're not um, just walking around logical beings. And in fact, um, looking at Jason Reinhardt, right, not a logical being. There's some emotion there. Uh, his wife is agreeing, right? We don't just go around making logical decisions all the time. We'd like to assume we do. And even in our behavior and mannerisms, we can act as if we're just making the logical, rational decision, but we're not. We're emotional creatures. We're believing animals. We're uh, uh, ruled not always by uh, our brains, but more by our hearts. And that plays a role in how we interact with one another and how we interact with God. And so we have to break free from this kind of logical um, imprisonment we put ourselves in and, and move into the fact that we have relationship, that we're called to relationship, and that when we have fellowship with one another, we're embracing those realities. 
Um, and this kind of leads into two definitions and, and I'll, I'll give them to you and then I'll try to break them down a little bit. There's the porous self of scripture versus the buffered self of modernity, okay, of modern times. And I've got two illustrations there. The, the porous self is one with a key, meaning uh, things are open, I'm giving you access. Uh, and the buffered self is uh, the one with the, the castle there. And, um, you know, I'm going to read this, this little passage here. But, you know, modern messengers have a clear boundary between mind and world, even mind and body. Moral and other meanings are in the mind. They cannot, um, uh-oh. All right, um, are you guys not seeing the slides? It stopped my sharing. That's the problem, huh? That's not important. You didn't want to see those slides. How about now? Now do you see the slides? Now is life better? Okay. I know my icons and graphics are what bring you back every week. Um, but we tend to have this thing that we're just, we're, we're logical and we go through this, but we're also just vulnerable to, to things. And, and the way that people thought in scripture, times of the scriptures being written, uh, things were more porous and they, they believed the world interacted with their lives, right? And so we can see in scripture um, conversation about demons and people have a legitimate belief in that and they have a legitimate experience with that because their lives are not um, dictated by uh, the logic of what they understand they're dictated by their experience and their feelings and they have to give meaning to that and so there's this porousness that's open to the world and interaction open to experience and open to others and open to what god might be doing in the world where the buffered self is, I can figure it out. I have things worked into my identity. There's a disengagement between our mind and our body. Uh, there's a disengagement between what we're feeling. Um, you know, another example might be uh, that we're vulnerable to uh, inward things affecting us. Uh, but in the modern time, if we're feeling depressed or melancholy, we're told that it's just your body chemistry. You're just hungry there's a hormone malfunction or whatever. And then we can feel relieved because in our mind, we've figured out how to treat this. And the reality is there's something brewing in us, but it, we want to define it and put it in boxes. And so we can do the very same thing when we come into fellowship. We come into this relationship. We come into these dynamics where um, we can put things in boxes. We put events and activities in boxes. We put people in boxes. And we're not open and aware to what's going on. We're not allowing ourselves um, and accepting how we're affected by different things. And I think this really depletes our ability to experience the living God and experience fellowship and experience the kingdom when we put things in boxes and we've defined them in ways that they've always been defined. And the reality is when the church is made up of humans who are experiencing a living and active God with a living and active scripture, uh, with a spirit that moves through each member, uh, we have to be porous and open to the changing dynamics, and it will never be the same in different times and places. And therefore, there, you can't have this buffered idea that um, I'm closed off and I'm distant. And for the fellowship aspect, you are not your own person. You are a part of a greater uh, interaction, a greater narrative. And so um, we cannot have our faith. We can't have my, I can't have my faith without our faith, uh, essentially in Christianity. There's just not a fitting for that in the kingdom of God. And I want to look at three practical um, ideas that I think we can embrace with this um, that'll help us to uh, pursue an openness to fellowship that will hopefully help us feel renewed towards fellowship and renewed towards connection. Number one is don't predefine meaning. And this is going to come, this is definitely come into play during this, this time of our lives in this pandemic. Like we have a predefined meaning of what church should be. Uh, some of us, hopefully not many of us, have a predefined meaning of where ch church should be. It should have a steeple. It should have stained glass. Um, uh, 
you know, it has this kind of concept of, of what it should look like. Many of us are used to the ICOC. Okay, three so two, one song welcome, three song sermon, one song communion, like a Jason's smiling, he knows what I'm talking about. Um, a predefined meaning of what church should be. And then we have a pandemic and we're forced online, we're forced in homes, we're forced half in person, half in, not in person. And our predefined meaning of church and worship has been altered. And that doesn't mean it's not worship and that doesn't mean it's not church, but our predefined meanings have been altered. If we can't get past that, then we lose our openness to what God might be doing. We lose our openness to what people are in our lives and we lose that connection. And I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter seven. Uh, this is the power of porousness is that it flips um, hospitality on its head. And some of you might've read this as um, uh, the homework a few weeks ago uh, in regards to you know, picking a passage of scripture and sitting in it. Uh, but Luke chapter seven is an interesting dynamic. If you were to predefine uh, this story, it doesn't work out the way that you would define it. And I'm going to summarize it because I'm hoping we all read it or are familiar with it. Uh, but it says, then one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house, reclined at the table. And as a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with perfume. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who's touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He tells a story about two debtors who owed money and they were both forgiven. He says, which one do you think, uh, uh, which one do you think loved him more? And he goes, supposedly the one who forgave more. Uh, top right here. Uh, you have judged correctly. And then turning to the woman, he said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say that amongst themselves, who is the man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay. If we were to predefine this experience, uh, who would we define as the host? Well, obviously the Pharisee. The Pharisee invited Jesus. The Pharisee is the host, and Jesus is the one being hosted. The Pharisee is the server. Jesus is the one being served. But if we look at the scripture a little more carefully, yes, the Pharisee invited him to the house, but it was the woman who was really hosting Jesus. The woman who the, is the one who attended to the Messiah. It was the woman who greeted him with uh, a kiss and weeped at his feet and washed his feet and, and took all the acts of hospitality. It was the woman who was playing host to Jesus. And then during the meal, as people were critical of this, Jesus all of a sudden takes over as host and he says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And then at the end, those who at the table began to say amongst us, who is this man who forgives his sins? And so we look at this. If we had a predefined understanding of this scene, we would say that Jesus and this woman were poor hosts or poor, poor guests. And in fact, the woman was uninvited and didn't belong there. But when we're encountering people, we have to not have a predefined understanding, a predefined meaning of what it is going on. God is working at all opportunities. And if we have a predefined meaning of who is host and who is being hosted, then we limit what God can do in our lives. And I think we do this a lot with church. Okay, when I go to church, uh, it's the pastor's job to preach, it's the singer's job to sing, and it's my job to sit there and enjoy myself. And if that is your definition of church, one, you're greatly mistaken, and you're also lacking of those experiences because you're when you're in the congregation, it's difficult to determine who's hosting guests because the Spirit's working through everybody to bring community and fellowship. Uh, we can do the same thing with Bible studies. We can show up to a Bible study going, yep, I'm going to study the Bible with Kelly Reinhardt, and I got so much to help her with. She is so lost, and I miss all that I might have to learn from her in the same time where I'm teaching her the scriptures about being a disciple. There's things in her life about grace and purpose that I might be lacking. 
And we have to kind of not predefine the meaning of different events and activities. And there's many times we do this. We can look at Bible talk and say, well, this is what it is. This is all it'll be. And I don't really want to go. We can even look at midweek and go, well, it's online and it's digital. And Chris might be amped up on caffeine or just exhausted. So it's not going to be a meaningful meeting. And we predefine the meaning. I think an example from tonight would be, I expect to jump into these rooms and to listen to conversation and get, hear your responses from the homework. Tonight, it was flipped. Neil took my host title right from me and hosted me, and I was the guest in that discussion. And it was kind of encouraging to be invited into the discussion like I hadn't been before. Now everybody will do it, and uh, brownie points to all of you. But we need to, to, to renew our idea of fellowship, we can't predefine the meaning of what Sunday church is, what midweek is. We have to go into it with eager expectation that God is a living and active God who is going to work in the fellowship. Uh, second point, come ready to give. Uh, this ties into the first point. If you're ever going into any area of your life, I think the Good Samaritan would would universalize this command. We need to go into the world ready to give, ready to play host to whomever God might put in our path. And I don't know if I shared this story with this group. I think I shared it with another group. I, I use the phrase, perform the scriptures. And people didn't like that. They felt like it was hypocritical in an actor, but an actor is doing their best to bring a script to life. They are performing the script given to them. And we are performing the scriptures as given to us. And you can't just read the, good Samar the parable of the Good Samaritan and say, yes, go do exactly this. I don't know where you're going to find that circumstance again. You have to be a neighbor to somebody in whatever situation you're in. And I remember driving to dinner. And if I share this with you, I'll, I'll make it brief. I was going to meet my parents for dinner a few weeks back. And we're driving down the road and we'd just gotten some snow. And I looked over at this pseudo bus stop and just beyond the pseudo bus stop they'd kind of built, uh, I saw somebody fall in the snow. And I kind of put two and two together. That's right outside of this retirement home, I think. They fell in the snow. I drove another block or two. I told them, we got to go back. I, I just can't in my good conscience not go back and make sure that person got up out of the snow. So we turn around and go back. It's not a retirement home. It was a home for um, people with uh, Alzheimer's. And this woman had escaped and she was still laying in the snow and she was probably about 90, 95 years old. And so I picked her up and I helped pick up all the different things that she had brought out and walked her to the side door. And Amy went in the front to get a doctor to come open the side door. And they went in and the lady goes, I don't know how she got out. And, um, but I, I just was ready to give. And I think a lot of these things that I've been reading and praying through and, and this kind of change in my mentality I didn't go to serve that woman. I was going to a meal with my parents, but I was open the posture and my life was porous to the fact that wherever I go, there's somebody to serve and give to. And this is a universal thing from scripture. And so we have to, I think we'll feel much more renewed when we have an attitude that we are the giver, that we're always being called to play host, even though the tables might re be reversed. We need to always plan to be host and then be pleasantly surprised and joyous to be the guests. Acts 20, 34 through 38. I don't know where Paul gets this from. We don't have a direct quote of Jesus ever saying this. But in his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders, he says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. He says the Lord Jesus himself said this. It might have been like a side conversation that him and Jesus had, maybe in that bright light. It was just, we don't know. Uh, but he's accrediting it to the words of Jesus. And if you look at what he says here, you yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. Paul went to every city, not looking to be taken care of, but to looking to give. He was the preacher. He was the guest speaker. And in all acts of hospitality should have been given too, but he did so because oftentimes the ones who aren't served are usually the ones who can't serve themselves. We are really good as Americans as serving VIPs. We're really good as Americans. We're wired to serve those who we uh, socially are called to respect. 
But Paul, much like Jesus, looked to everyone, including here the phrase, the weak, in his mentality, it's better to give than to receive. And so if we're always ready to give, the fellowship becomes more rewarding because we're looking for the opportunities to give what we have. Whatever it might be, as small as it might be, we're looking for the opportunities to give. And we're trusting in Paul that these words of Jesus are true. That it's more blessed to give to, than to receive. Now, this isn't a direct quotation, but I think Jesus talks about it, the same concept here. He says, Jesus called the 12 over and said to them, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to appear great among you will be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so again, we've got to come ready to give, ready to serve with the mentality that I am a slave to whomever Jesus puts in my path, whomever I encounter. And as we show up to a fellowship, it might be 100 people, 200 people worshiping. It could be a midweek, it could be a small group, it could be a Bible study, that we come ready to be givers, that we come ready to be servants. And we don't know what we have to give. I know when I come on Sunday mornings, there's an expectation that I give a sermon. So I kind of know what I'm coming to give. Um, but we don't always know the other areas we can give. It could be a conversation, a smile, a hug, a meal. It could be anything. Whatever we have, we're called to give. I think about coming up on Christmas to a little drummer boy. That's the mentality we want as we go into fellowship. All right. So don't predefine it because that limits it. Come ready to give. That's the posture we have to have. And then finally, set out to discover the living God. I think one of the things that is so lacking at times in our lives is when we first studied the Bible become Christians, we were discovering new things about God every day. When we read the scriptures, something new stood out. As we interact with the fellowship, something new stood out. But somehow over time, we lose this sense of discovery. And we've defined God in so many ways that he becomes this buffered reality that's not really there. There's not really anything to experience. I pray to God. He answers whenever he wants. And we create these distances. And we lose this sense of discovery. A poorest self is open to it. And when you read the scriptures, you see people who are credited with faith because they were open to what God was calling them to do. One of the coolest revelations I've had in the past year or two is reading the book of Acts and realizing there was no master plan to their evangelism. There was no plan at all. It was often motivated by persecution and people running for their lives and just sharing the good news wherever they might have landed. There's no plan to it. They were just discovering what God was doing. Um, even reading uh, Paul in the New Light, um, this great book called The Echoes of Scripture, and talking about how Paul is actually like re-understanding the Old Testament and trying to explain his experience with Jesus. And that's what we're doing is in this stage of life, we have to redefine what our experience with Jesus is telling us and re-understand it, in some ways, reinterpret the scriptures and what they mean to us. Um, th there's going to be greater depth in the experiences we have and the greater depth in the times we place, but we have to set out to discover what God is doing. When we show up the church, again, not predefined, we're discovering what God might do today. How might God move my heart? How might God speak to me? How might God provide an opportunity for me? Where might God be working in my life and in, in this environment that we're going into? And in Matthew 25, I think this is the, the importance. And, and we tend to look at this scripture in Matthew 25 more for the judgment side. I think that says something about our theology. But there's something else here in the opportunity to discover Jesus in other people to see Jesus in the weak, to see Jesus in the oppressed, to see Jesus in the stranger, to see Jesus in the oppressor and in the victim and in the, the, uh, the, the guilty. And so Matthew 25 says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And that's the mentality we have to have. 
I am discovering where Christ might be in this moment and place. Where might Jesus present himself in my daily encounters, in my oikos, in my community, in my family, in the fellowship? When I show up on Sunday, who might Jesus present himself to me as? And I only shared the positive side of this, Matthew 25. Uh, the other one's not as positive, and you can read that one if you'd like. It's, it's those who saw the least among them and did nothing. We have to be discovering what God might be doing. He will continually challenge our thinking of who is open and who is not open, who is a friend and who is not a friend. And if we want to have renewal, we need to approach our life as discovering where might God present himself today? Where might God reveal himself in somebody else? Where might I encounter the divine? God always shows up oftentimes in obscure places like a burning bush in the desert or in other people. Most of the time, those who are oppressed, those who are forgotten, and those from outside. So as we're going through life, I'm, and, and we're talking about renewing the fellowship and renewing our engagement with fellowship, uh, we have to have an openness, a porousness, where we're knowing that you can't define you without we. You can't define yourself without community. And to help us in that, uh, we don't want to predefine meaning, but have an open meaning a dis that we're we're discovering things wherever we go, that we're coming ready to give, that we are playing host and then open to any opportunities to be guests, and that we set out to discover the living God. So this is my hope for us in the fellowship, and this is your homework. No class next week. It's Thanksgiving. Enjoy your time, uh, whatever you might be doing, uh, but here's your homework. Uh, I want you to do these three things and then just write about your experience. Kelly, write this down. You'll be graded completely on your homework for next week. Uh, reach out to someone. And I'd like you to write a letter. It could be just a card, but a real one with your own hand. As Paul says, look at these large letters. I write this with my own hand. But I want you to write a letter. It could be a gratitude. It could be a forgiveness. It could be an encouragement. But I want you to write a letter with your own hand. It's a way of us... Um, playing host. It's a way of us being open to things. It's a way for us to uh, be givers in an unexpected way. Okay. The second one is to reverse the table. I want you to take a situation that you would be served and flip the roles. I want you to play the role of, of the, the sinful woman or of Jesus in those meal invitations. Where's a place where you can flip the role, reverse the table, it could happen in, you know, your family meals. It could happen in uh, your household chores. It could happen with a coworker or what, whatever it might be. What's a place where you can reverse the table? Go from being given to to being the giver. Go from being hosted to, to playing host. And the third one here is, I want you to take the time to discover Jesus in the other. Remove labels, titles, and positions and discover where God might be working. I just want you to... Try to open up your posture to who might be uh, there in your life, who Jesus might be revealing himself to. Um, it could be uh, the homeless man on the corner. It could be uh, the widow down the street. It could be uh, the neighbor you didn't know was ill. It could be many things or places. Um, and then how do you discover that person and, and, and perhaps meet their needs? That's kind of the next person, but... Uh, we're really working on this open and discovery. The ultimate goal is that when we approach fellowship and engagement, we have an openness uh, to what God might be doing, uh, that we come into it with excitement and discovering, not predefining, uh, it's just another Sunday church service, but an expectation that the living God will be present. I got about four minutes here before I have to jump into the next class. Uh, any questions before we jump in? I have no idea what you're saying, Jason. I can mute and unmute people, but I can't block their screen. Oh, I can. I can stop his video. All right, raise your hands if I should stop Jason's video. Raise your hand if I should stop his video. I only needed one vote. There it is. Yay, it worked. <laughs>
That was for you, Kevin. Oh, you want to bring him back? Uh, he's got to do that. I can't control his cameras. <laughs> now I can't bring them back. <laughs> oh, well, we tried. That was not an abuse of power. It was, it was an open democracy, and you guys just didn't show up to vote. That's not my fault. Can you not unmute yourself? They oh. All right, you're on. You're yeah. on Sorry. <laughs> he couldn't we unmute. Can, him. We can talk again. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, love it. That was awesome. I don't know why all these settings keep, I keep getting accused of doing oh, all these it, settings. It, it's got to be the computer's it. fault. It's the computers. Computer. It's got to be. Zoom, it's out to get Chris. <laughs> Zoom. At least everybody can publicly chat. I got chastised in the eight o'clock class because I don't let them chat to each other and be distractions. <laughs> so, Peter, it was an abuse of power on all of us, not just me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a. Uh, there's just one point I'd like to point out that I think I've talked to people about to me is there's aspect of I think you kind of left out is allowing other people to minister to you because you can be so much wanting to minister to other people that God will want somebody else to minister to you and you're so focused on somebody else you don't let him interact with you and receive a blessing from somebody else yeah and i've done that before so it's like and yeah I think that, sorry i was gonna say that goes into that first point of don't predefine meaning of who is the giver and who is the taker who is the discipler and who is the disciple and, and just point. saying that i've seen that too often or i've done that where i have to go i'm there to talk to a certain person and i go see them instead of letting God kind of define, okay, this today, you didn't quite get to them, but God had somebody else that going to mm -hmm. talk to you about issue that you never thought about that you need to talk about, but you didn't think about God brought it up and somebody ministered to you, but you can have an attitude of, you don't receive that. And it turns people off and it, they have a hard time serving when you're not willing to be served. Yeah, you know, and usually many of the words. But I just thought that was something to think about. That's a great point. All right, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Text or email if you have any questions um, or if you're going through the homework and need some help. Thanks, Chris. Bye, everybody. Next call. See you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>